Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about a recent debate between Sora Bamari and Dustin Guastella about how the unions and labor movement uh, should relate to the Democratic and Republican parties. Sora Bamari asks, how can the GOP mend fences with unions? Labor's role as an appendage of the Democrats isn't good for workers. The Democratic Party isn't a labor party after all. It's a coalition of various interest groups, including much of Wall Street, big tech, and the upper professional class. Blue city social segments that can be as fiercely opposed to worker power as any red state mining magnet. But if Republicans want less woke and less Democratic Party dependent unions, they had better start by extending an open hand rather than showing labor the back of the hand, as the party has done since the Reagan era. Guastella responds, that's never going to happen because the Republican Party remains the party of business first and foremost. And there are a lot of people who will pay a lot of money to ensure that it stays that way. And uh, we today we have Catherine Liu joining us. Uh, Catherine, what did you think about these pieces? And do you think that the Democratic or Republican Party can be a vehicle for the advancement of the working class? OK, so can you hear me? Is that good? Yeah. Um, I don't think either party can advance the interests of the working class. And we are trapped in a two party system that is not democratic any longer. If we want to believe in democracy and as historical materialists, I don't think it's our role to believe in demo um, democratic processes, but to see them as the expressions of like a motive liberalism that has guaranteed a certain kind of, um, I don't want to use this for Colden word, but I'll just use it for now, like governmentality for now. And um, it's failing and it has failed the working class. It has failed the majority of Americans and it continues to fail the majority of Americans. And I thought it was really interesting that Saurabh Amari um, in trying to revive the um, prospects of the Republican Party, which he sees as being threatened. Each, each side sees itself as kind of losing or vulnerable. He um, wants to revive his work, or not even revive, let's just say like revive tactical alliances between the Republican Party and the working class or the unions, you could say, which Nixon did in a very tactical way in the 70s strategic way, you know, Machiavellian way, if you like. And then Guastella says, um, in response, um, the Republicans are the class of the party of the capitalists, and they will never be friends of the working class. And I frankly, like, I, I really like Dustin, I like his points of view. But I frankly was really surprised by his um, advocacy for collaboration between working class organizations like unions and the Democratic Party. I mean, I know the arguments, but I think um, we're at a political dead end with regard to both parties and working class interests. Yeah. Can we just jump in? Um, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And that's something that I've noticed in Guastella's thought as well. Um, he wrote uh, several years back with um, Abbott, that article in Jacobin about the party surrogate, which I found to be a very good article. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had a, a discussion with him at one point, and I remember asking him, like, the party surrogate model that he was advocating, which is basically a, a party that operates sort of independently from the ballot line, right? You know, participates in Democratic primaries but maintains organizational independence. Couldn't such a party also participate in Republican primaries? Couldn't it participate in both primaries and potentially in running its own mm. candidates? And he was, at that point, very strongly opposed to the idea that the party surrogate should participate in both Democratic and Republican primaries. And I didn't understand why. It, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem logical to me. And mm -hmm. you see in this argument between Ahmadi and Guastella, like, I, I think they both make perfectly valid points. I think, um, but I, I think fundamentally it doesn't really matter who's right on which party is slightly more likely than the other to be sympathetic to working class interests. Why not just participate in both parties, you know, opportunistically? Like, what? why are they not yeah. willing to entertain this? I, I don't understand it. Um, I, I also think that, if you go through the numbers, I mean, 
I'm not a political pundit or anything, but if I did pay attention, as most of us did, I mean, those of us on the left, I hope, with the jaundiced eye to the um, uh, exit polling and the analysis of the votes in New Hampshire and Iowa. And, I, you know, um, Trump beat Nikki Haley on every single, um, in, in every single working class demographic. Nikki Haley kicked his ass with wealthier Republicans, you know, with higher incomes and college educations. So I think de facto, I mean, whether people like it or not, Trump in his kind of like primal father, charismatic baby disruptor, um, carnivalesque mental, um, imago has attracted to him this kind of working class animus against a system that we should all have a deep animus against. I don't think he's like a productive representative of um, working class anger, but he certainly reflects it. And so I'm, I'm like it. I didn't know that. Um, well, Amari, you know, seems to say that the Republicans have to bend over backwards and make these policy um, changes. But at this point, like on a very superficial level, or you know, very important semiotic level, Trump is like. Um, this carnivalesque working class avatar of working class discontentment. And, you know, whatever, and the Democrats, on the other hand, just see working class people as fascists now. So um, we're at this really grotesque political, um, political positionality. Trump may or may not be fascist. I don't think so, personally. I think he's like opportunistic. He's charismatic. He's perfectly attuned towards the media. He is able to speak to people's discontent, deep, deep discontent and their desire for catharsis. But the points that he touches upon um, that are really attractive are points that the Democrats want to crush the working class on. And I'm going to say something very unpopular, which has to do with like immigration. And, you know, um, Basically, Angela Nagel was hounded out of the left because she said that there was a left case for closed borders. Um, Nonsite.org asked me to respond to that article, and I responded in support of our article, and they suppressed it. Mm. So it's really like a, um, it's really a taboo topic. And I'm very interested in taboo topics right now. Like on my Substack, we're dealing with totem taboo. We're talking a lot about how it becomes part of the authoritarian personality, questions of ambivalence, and like we, the idea that we cannot talk about some kind of immigration control because the PMC liberal left, you know, won't allow for it is, you know, one of the great impasses of our time. And the, but the more I think about this, more I think like this is something we should be thinking about, we're talking about you know, on the left as a position. Yeah, I think Trump, I, I also don't know quite how to explain, you know, how he is able to rally a working class base. But uh, maybe, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure his talk about the the immigration issue is part of that. I it's remember, not a base, though. If I can correct you, it's not a right. base. It's not an organized constituency. I mean, all the for all the um, um, talk about like spontaneity and organic stuff, it's it's a purely like affectual reactive um, um, group grouping. And I and I don't know how to even describe it within like democratic politics. I don't. I, I think to call it a base is to like rationalize it in some way. Yeah, I guess to call it a base would imply that. Uh, Trump is actually offering something to working class people and he's delivering and he's winning their loyalty when actually exactly. he's just kind of spewing whatever pops into his head. And some of it lands, some of it doesn't. But the the, the promises he actually makes to working class people don't actually um, come through. I mean, didn't he say, um, you know, we needed to bring the jobs back from from NAFTA, from Clinton's NAFTA, from China? I I don't remember hearing anything about you know him delivering on that so that's definitely a good point right yeah i mean trump is fundamentally a, a branding and marketing guy right like that's his whole shtick and he's in his own particular brilliance he's he's understood 
the vulnerability of the kind of ossified two-party structure. And he, it, particularly, you know, in the Republican primary, you know, back in back in um, uh, twenty twenty. Um, or I guess no, 2016. 2016. 2016. Yeah, sorry. In the Republican primary in 2016, uh, you know, the the big standout moment, I think the the one that really got people to take him, you know, sort of seriously was when he stood up and he denounced the Iraq war, which a supermajority of the population thought was a terrible idea at that point, but which the Republican establishment had been refusing to acknowledge was a terrible idea, right? And his ability to kind of buck Republican orthodoxy and to show that he is oppositional, not just to the, to the liberal establishment, but also to the Republican establishment, I think is what got him a lot of that credibility. And his inability or disinterest in actually effectuating policy, uh, you know, it hurts him. I think it, it, it hurt him around the edges. It hurt him marginally. But, but he does still have this, particularly when you're running against a guy like Biden, right? Like a lot of people are going to say, well, at least at least Trump is saying the right things, even if I don't trust him to deliver. But he he points the way forward. I think this is Ahmadi's kind of dream is that Trump is pointing the way forward for a Republican Party that actually identifies the the potential of this kind of populist politics and implements it and kind of becomes the new de facto party of government, right? In the same way that after FDR, the Democrats became the de facto party of government by embracing and, and championing this populist message. Guastella is perfectly in his rights to say, well, the Republican Party is controlled by people who would rather lose elections than do that, right? But you could say the same thing about the Democrats. The Democrats are controlled by people who would rather lose elections, and we saw this with Bernie, right? They would rather lose elections than implement some kind of broadly popular, you know, populist uh, politics. Then, but, but, I and I still, I'm coming back to this, this issue where it's like, uh, Guastella and Ahmadi should, in an ideal country, they would be in the same political party. Uh, you know, fundamentally, they don't disagree with each other on anything substantive, as far as I can tell. You know, maybe around the edges, but, uh, you know, some broad-based social democratic party could, in a functional democracy, could easily encompass both of them as, like, different internal factions. But they refuse to to kind of view themselves as being part of the same political camp, right? They're so obsessed with this kind of you know, mar are the Democrats marginally better? Are the Republicans marginally better? Is there marginally more prospects than one or the other? That they can't, they can't say, well, why don't we just form an organization that embraces both of these perspectives and see what works? You know, I, you I know, just don't get it. Um, Guastella um, reached out to me after I posted on this thing, and he said he would he would be really willing to debate Amari. Like he wants to get in the same room as Amari. And um, I was like, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm the person to do that. I, I mean, I could t definitely moderate that debate. I don't know where that would take place, but um, necessarily. But I think, I think you're right. I think that actually would be the third party, and that would be really powerful. My feeling about Amari is that you know, I, and I think Compact is a really interesting project, and I publish in it is that he's got like really much deeper pockets and he's got a lot more support um, financially from some like traditional Catholic um, conservatives who are really unhappy with the, Demo with the way the Republicans are going. So from the point of view of damage where I'm sitting on the editorial board, the discussions about damage versus compact are often like, we don't have any money. They, got, they have all the money. And there's this kind of like, resentment and um which is you know materially true i mean um compact is able to pay much better it pays its editors it's amari's um kind of notoriety or fame and his having published just this book with a major press puts him in the um mainstream or from some kind of like center right mainstream might um, have a place for him and damage feels that it's, you know, really, um, and I, I, I'm not too, I, I'm not in love with this position. Like it's more marginal. It's a labor of love. It's got, you know, everyone volunteers their time. So it's one of these like typical, um, left, right divisions, mainstream marginal divisions. And, um, I think the dream would be that there would be a, there would be a leftist donor or philanthropist who would, you know, elevate damage in the same way that the um, unhappy conservatives have supported compact. 
So that that's kind of like the material difference um, about why they can't get in the same room. But I'm like, yes, let's get in the same room. At this point, um, at this point, I think the Democrat, the the Gostella's fidelity to the Democrats is like, um, uh, I don't know what to say. It's like a, a quaint or something. Like, uh, I, I want to take him to task on it frankly. Yeah, I I mean, I suspect, I I don't know what Ahmari does for a living, but I, I, <laughs> my sense is that both of them, um, you know, was, you know, declare their loyalty to each party in, in probably because they find themselves embedded in, you know, uh, these patronage networks right. that are, y- you know, um, that that are centered around each party. So Guest, the Guestella case is obvious. He's a staffer for uh, a, the, Teamsters. The, Teamsters. Yeah. the Teamsters. The Teamsters. So huge, huge union. Uh, I, I believe he's um, involved in a research project, which may or not be funded by those unions, but sort of a um, like a, a, a project for the advancement of of you know working class democratic policy polit- uh, policies. So uh, how do we get the uh, you know what kind of policies can the Democratic Party pursue to be better on working class issues? Uh, so I th- I think he's attached his you know he's hitched his you know himself to that bandwagon you know a long time ago, and uh, that explains uh, what Jamal was talking about earlier. Why even an independent surrogate party would only, you know, in his eyes, be able to run on the Democratic Party ballot line. Uh, and, you know, Ahmari, I, uh, I I, didn't know that he was getting these uh, big donations from these Catholic institutions who are probably also, uh, uh, Catherine, I imagine they're somehow... I think they're donors. I'm not sure they're institutions. And I feel like okay. all the more power to him. All the more yeah. power to him, you know? Sure. But But... Um, but it's, I think it, Compact's is an important project at this point. Sure. Well, it's funny that each of these people are able to recognize the huge interests uh, driving the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Akhmari describes, you know, the Democratic Party as the party of Wall Street, of big tech, of, you know, the professional class. Guestella describes the Republican Party as the party of big business. Okay, they, they've got this materialist analysis, which totally tells you why hope is lost for the other party, but somehow they can't, you know, point that analysis to the own part, their own party they're advocating for. Right, hope springs eternal when you're looking at the team that you've kind of found yourself embedded in, right? But yeah. So do we, do we, do, so um, is, and I often think about this now, is what we need to start a third party like a uh, an enlightened donor? <laughs> because well, all I of mean... those structures, all of those structures of um, patronage, like they begin that they, they are so deeply embedded on the liberal left now. You know, DSA has just become a complete arm of um, actually the more extreme versions of identity politics in the Democratic Party. I didn't expect it to go this way, but it certainly doesn't re- represent working class interests. Um, the, <laughs> I, I'm less clear about like the Republican Party factionalism, but it just seems like every time there's an election, we all have to harmonize our interests and you know um, um, support the party. And at this point, like young people that I've, you know, um, encountered who are working within these structures, they want to enter the patronage system. They want to have political careers. They want to be lobbyists. They want to work for the Teamsters. And so within, or, you know, within, um, or they, they, they want to work in DSA. And so there is a complete like funding and um, professionalization um, elevator that goes, that that's part of, that's part of the infrastructure. Um, that go, reaches out into the unions, right? So I'm just like, how do you compete? I mean, how, we, on the level of ideas, we may be right. And, you know, the majority of the working class might agree with us, 
But how do we even reach them? I do believe the majority of the working class agrees with us because kind of like I'm I'm just like fuck both of them, fuck you know may they both rot in hell and um, they're all hyper groomed you know, in war hawks and uh, they don't care about um, the American working class at this point. That's the last thing. That's the last thing they care about. And um, but but how do we reach this? Uh, how do we reach a level of um, visibility? I mean, I don't know what class unity does with regard to, you know, outward, outward facing activities or things like that. But um, I think if like you guys went, if we all went to a bar somewhere in the Rust Belt and our points of view would not be controversial, you know, um, but I, I just like, I, I, I don't know how that next step is taken. And maybe I'm just too hidebound or pragmatic or or um lacking in imagination, but I keep thinking like we need we need to have like some very discontented <laughs> oligarch yeah. who says this is where all right, you guys, we're, we're gonna help you here. Because I hate both sides of the I you know but that's like dreaming, man. That's, Eric. Yeah, we need um, legitimate millionaires to, (laughs) you know, fund our political projects. I mean, it seems like there's kind of a note of maybe hopelessness with this whole thing. If the avenues of real political activity are so thoroughly locked down by, you know, existing institutions, the parties. Okay, so what I'm hopeful about is actually how people are, people reject the um, ruling parties. It's very yeah. reactive, but they keep rejecting it. There, it's unga- we're, we're, We live in an ungovernable country right now. We live in ungovernable localities, but um, there's a kind of re- popular rejection of whoever is ruling. And so it's very, very destabilizing. I'm not saying Trump is going to win, but Trump lost because people rejected him. There were enough people who rejected him. And maybe that will happen with Biden, too. So the best that we can hope for is this kind of like destabilized um polity well do you think that trump is a good example of someone who's rel- a relative outsider to the political establishment and who galvanizes people around a really legitimate hatred of the political system overall i mean is there any sort of potential in that kind of movement for the for the you mean in him in his, in his persona or in I don't know. I mean, I, I'm I'm just I know there's I don't know if people are still seriously talking about like the whole idea of like MAGA communism or something like this. But is there any even feasible connection where that kind of anti-establishment ethos could be morphed into like a genuine working class movement? Or is Trumpism just its own thing that ultimately just I mean, in power, Trump is just a docile Republican. So he's not he's anti-establishment and message but that doesn't really go very far or even um dos i would just say ineffectual mm. yeah. an ineffectual yeah. a docile republican actually right right um i, uh, I don't the, have the an one, answer for this the one thing that i've found interesting is this the scuttlebutt that maybe tucker will be trump's vice president right because i i do think that what trump needs to be effective is to have an ideas guy actually in charge of the government right but an ideas guy who isn't just a normal Republican ideas guy, an ideas guy who is one of these kind of the people who who are engaged in this process of elaborating and extrapolating on the political stances that Trump has staked out and and concretizing them into actual policies. Um, uh, Trump with that kind of Trump with like a populist Dick Cheney in the vice president's seat, I think could actually be quite effective. But Trump on his own without this kind of, without a brain basically to actually run the government is is just totally worthless as as a president he's he's not capable of doing anything right and that's why he lost in in 2020 um i i don't know i mean i think clearly you said this you know a couple of minutes ago catherine clearly the american public basically agrees on the politics that we espouse, the politics that Ahmadi espouses, the politics that, that Guestella espouses, they're not that different. They're all kind of in the same general vein. The American public agrees with it, but it's impos- It's the American people have found, found it impossible to translate that general kind of diffuse sentiment into actual policy change because the institutions are so captured and 
it's impossible to dislodge one of the parties without the other party, which is just as bad kind of governing in the interim. And then you've you've basically accomplished nothing, right? You can dislodge mm-hmm. one, the other party comes in and, and protects the status quo, and then the same thing happens again, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, it, it's... It, and we've we've been out talking to people here in chicago which i think is as fertile as any major city is going to be and mm-hmm. you know, people love mm-hmm. it people think it's a total breath of fresh air you mm-hmm. know when they hear yeah you can you can have just straightforward class politics you don't have to buy into all these identity politics shibboleths you can believe whatever you want on cultural issues and we don't care people love that but yeah without without some sugar daddy to fund a media apparatus like it's it's kind of it's kind of hard well you know what i went on jimmy Dore and i got like such a intense response from his audience and i'm like okay so should i be pushing this more but i don't want it to be like my brand like it has to be a more sustained effort on the part of an organization actually to say, you know, it's not just me who's saying this because people would say, I felt like professors have all lost their minds. I thought all members of the professional class were, you know, insane about, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I was like, no, um, but it's definitely a minority voice. And, um, you know, we are like, I'm in the bottom of a well, kind of like shouting outside of it, but what, barring like a larger organizational, you know, um, apparatus structure it's just like a it's a one-shot deal on jimmy Dore, which i thought was really interesting because he was really angry at the democratic party he's like a betrayed lip right and he's like and cnn and msnbc and they are they all suck and i was like have you looked at the numbers nobody watches that stuff like their numbers are plummeting it's like out of a hundred out of a country of 330 million people like maybe 10 million people are watching those channels he's got a million subscribers so actually he's thinking of himself legitimately as a um competitor but i was like jimmy look they're all like aging boomers they're all pmc types they're watching cnn you're railing against them but this is, they're hardly, like, they're hardly in play right now. I mean, we're mad at them because they seem to have so much power and airtime. And there actually does seem to be a kind of opening, uh, which Trump, you know, did take advantage of with regard to Fox. Well, I don't know what's happening with Fox right now. But, um, um, yeah, that's, uh, I don't want to be like a Debbie Downer, though, because I actually feel... This is like the weird thing about it. It's like, I feel that roiling discontent is like a sign of hope. Like if we were all just like resigned and just, you know, and and depressed, that would be one thing. But people are really pissed and they should be. I'm, I'm, I am I'm can't even tell you guys, how, you're recording this, so I'm not actually going to say, like, what the actual <laughs> issues are, because someone's going to clip it, and then I'm going to be in trouble. Like, the day I retire, I'll say these things. But <laughs> people are pissed about, like, these ridiculous positions that the lib- liberals and Democrats say we have to take. And people are not buying it. They're not buying their bullshit. Are you referring to the... I'm, I'm not even going to say. I can't even say. <laughs> we won't edit it out. The culture war stuff, yeah. The culture yeah, yeah. war stuff. We'll edit that out. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you're going to edit it out. Oh, yeah, editing. Yeah. <laughs> um, since when did become like the household god of the Democratic Party? Like, <laughs> actually, you know, I would think that that is like. If I were doing a psyop on destroying left solidarity, I would make that plan. I'm so please edit this out. I mean, Don't I worry. do want to say this at some point, but you know, maybe in a more measured way. So, yeah, I mean, you're right, and we will edit it out. But yeah, basically, that kind of stuff is is. Uh, you you will disseminate this in a in a more curated form, but you know, I actually think that. Um, there should be a platform where we can have these debates make right now. It's just insanity. So, um, you know, but I did already go out on a limb about, you know, immigration and things like that, but I do have a more, um, measured way of thinking about it, which is that the, um, if the liberals really do believe in the burdens of citizenship, I come from an immigrant family. Like the whole thing about immigration is that the immigrant, 
family or the immigrant unit is, it is the most self-interested unit under capitalism because it's displaced, it's looking to survive. And um, the questions of the burdens of citizenship just seem so remote for that population. And so if that is the case, then if we have immigration, then we have to have like education about democratic principles and yep. um, what it is and American history. Like it's not, a, I'm not being a nationalist here. I'm actually saying American um, social issues and problems are deeply grounded in working class agitation, immigrant working class agitation, and it should be leftist, a leftist education. But so many people arrive here and they just like, I gotta get ahead, I gotta get ahead, I gotta get ahead. Americans are rich. So I got, I have to like get ahead, I have to get, you know, I have to be rich. The idea, I mean, for my family, like that there were hungry Americans was not something that my parents could even like think about. It was like, what mm. the hell is that? You know, we just have to get ahead. We have to get ahead. So there's like civic education is lacking here on some level. And the question of solidarity too should be immediately like put to the fore. Like you are working class people who have more in common with a working class person next to you than with, you know, um, some avatar of American success. Yeah. And and I know, Steph, you've been waiting to get in, but just Oh, one sorry. Point... sorry. Oh no! Don't don't worry. It's it's all of our fault um, that we've been filibustering stuff. But um, I, I just did want to bring up one point in that I think the the worm is turning uh, on the immigration issue in particular. At least in Chicago, it's very apparent that this is shifting because Brandon Johnson, the kind of progressive mayor, has so totally mismanaged this this refugee wave, you know, from Central America. And you're seeing, you know, rebellions, particularly in working class Chinese and Hispanic and, and African American neighborhoods. People are just fed up with it. They're fed up with the fact that the city seems to care more about just finding some way to accommodate this huge wave of refugees than about ensuring social services, you know, for for the actual, you know, population, the the long term population of the city. I think that this is shifting, um, and that the 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 Democrats' insistence. Or not the Democrats' insistence, but like the the left progressives' insistence on pretending that you can just never enforce any any sort of immigration law is is no longer tenable. Uh, uh, let's put a pin in that. I've got more to say about this, but Stephanie, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was on on that note. I would say that like definitely in Black community organizations, there there's always been that discontent and that skepticism of the Democratic policy and the progressive line on immigration. Um, and I think that because there was like this collaboration for a while that was working um, uh, between, I would, I would say, I guess, 2016 and 2022, um, I, I think that a lot of that was like kind of under the radar, but I, I see it definitely um, becoming a lot more um, obvious now, I, again. Uh, and I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, mm -hmm. No, I, I I think we need to go out there and be more explicit about, you know, a real left position on immigration. So the um, sort of unintended global consequences of this lack of enforcement of the U.S. border has like deep effects in with within China. Right. So um, my um, friends there who are more on the left say that there is a kind of liberalism in the social media context that targets lower um, level, people of lower levels of education, people who are, um, you know, who are not going to college, who are working class, who think that America is still this like land of milk and honey, right? And the fact that the, um, the lack of enforcement at the border has created a new underground um, immigration uh, cartel that moves people through Morocco to Ecuador through, and they walk through the Darien Gap, through Panama, and they walk through Mexico to go to the American border, tens of thousands of people. And um, it, it's exploitative. And the Chinese who are more of the left, who are more educated, understand this is like exploiting a kind of the, the hard scrabble lives of these um, working class Chinese who are paying lots of money to go through this um, human trafficking, human smuggling um, system, and and they're right. 
to do this in some ways, even though when they arrive here, you know, it's a shock to see um, the American system, but they've heard that they can get asylum because the U.S. and China are in a war. They, they've heard that if they declare themselves like seeking a political asylum, and there's like all this stuff on Chinese social media about this, um, this avenue for a better life. And so um, it, it has just like incredibly destructive global consequences because when these people get here, they have no education. They, they confront the lack of health care. They confront like the kinds of jobs they get. And it's not good for them either. I don't know. I, I don't know the situation in Central and Latin America because I'm not connected to those countries. But I, I know what it's like now in China. And you have people walking with their four year olds from Ecuador to the southern border, thinking like there's going to be some great thing that's going to happen over there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, something similar happened. You know, I've got a lot of Palestinian relatives who who come to the U.S. And obviously, compared to living in Palestine, it's vastly better in, in a lot of ways. But I, I think people and I, I've been reading this book by Wang Huning. I don't know if you've read it. Uh, America Against America. Um, he I'm sure he's he's one of the kind of main ideologues of the Communist Party of China these days. And he came to the U.S. back in, I think it was the early 90s, and kind of wrote a book on his sort of reflections on the on the kind of erosion of the social fabric caused by neoliberalism. Oh, right, right, right. I know. Right, right, right. I it's a that. very interesting book. The, the translation is, frankly, it's very jank. It's like just kind of machine translated. So I'm sure I'm missing a lot. But it's a very interesting book. But, um, you know, one of the things that my relatives who come here with kind of they all are just coming here because there's no occupation and the, the economic prospects are better. But when you get to the U.S., depending on where you live, like you can find yourself, you know, in in a totally isolated suburban you know, environment where it's impossible to to reach friends and family basically right particularly like for example my 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 uncle married um a, a woman who was a, a nurse back in palestine and she came to the u.s thinking you know I'll, I'll get the nursing license and i'll start working as a nurse but turns out without a car without being able to drive she can't do anything you can't do anything and not only can you not work you can't have friends you know you, you you've grown up your entire life surrounded by family 24 7 and now suddenly you have nobody around your home alone you know for the first time in your entire life it's very depressing and i i think a lot of people who come to the u.s don't realize that that yeah the economic situation is better but there's something so fundamentally wrong with american society on this level that maybe you actually won't be happier in the long run but well it's like the atomization um weapon is most intensified a lot for immigrants and um because of all these because of the built environment um the car situation etc i mean you know for the chinese the low educate lower the educate the lower the education the poorer their english and so they're really isolated linguistically it's like yeah you're anyway i can i could go on and on about this but um but this i but it's also then very very hard for them to understand their plight in the greater arc of the um, struggles of the American working class. Yeah. And especially because of that atomization, of course, and our lack of like institutions and um, vehicles on the left to build solidarity. Across. And I guess in the early, you know, in the great waves of the 19th, early 20th century immigrate, immigrant populations, a lot of the um, Germans who came to the um, Midwest, a lot of the, um, the, there were churches, there were clubs, there were actual leftists who were fleeing persecution, right? After all the various failed revolutions in Europe. And so they brought a more cohesive um, organizational structure with them. Now, you know, all of our like, um, you know, non-governmental organizations are completely captured by, um, either the church, a conservative church, or, you know, liberal elites who are like, oh, we're going to do, we're going to help you, we're going to empower immigrants. And um, I didn't want to go so deeply into this, but I really am like very, very, um, just because of my own story, I, I'm, I'm like very concerned about the lack of understanding now for young people and immigrants about the socialist struggles of America 
Like the things that we have as working people in America came about because of leftist agitation. It wasn't like, oh, America was just really rich and they decided to do things for people. And now they're, you know, the capitalists are taking that away. But if, you know, immigrants, the, the Republican fantasy is that immigrants come and they become liberals and they vote Democratic. Um, this is this is a fantasy, but um, there is a way in which I think the Democrats do rely on immigrants, like um, not really participating in um, mm -hmm. political life, and that right. you know contributes to the sort of um, fragmentation and um, desertification of any kind of public civic notion of participation. Um, right. Yeah, so when they do, so when Democrats do advocate for open borders or, and things like that, they're not, it's not like they have this immigrant population in mind that they're like advocating to them. Um, I wonder who are, who, who they are signaling to when they say, you know, like, you know, open borders and things like well, that. Well, it, it's the it's the brainwashed PMC drones who are the the staffers and the NGO apparatchiks and and all these other people, right? And and this, the question of how these pay people became so indoctrinated into this bizarre ideology and how they kind of conquered all of these institutions is one that I still honestly don't understand. You know, like after so after, yeah, go ahead. So there's the you know it's been like 150 years of changing. Um, uh, of um, intensification of a certain kind of American Protestantism and the whole notion of helping because at the end of the 19th century, truly the working class and the American poor and immigrant population cities were deeply, deeply admiserated, right? So you have these progressive elites, you know, imbued with Victorian Protestant work ethics, really believing, I mean, including like people like Jane Addams, who, you know, is in many ways like a great heroine of the left, but the idea, and, and she tried to change the way that charity would be enjoined, but charity is their mode of dealing with people who have the working class. And that in and of itself, it immediately projects a disempowered, isolated person who doesn't speak English, you know, or who really doesn't have um, the wherewithal to advocate for themselves. So rather than, so the really scary person is the working class agitator or the union member, but the really passive, you know, person who you can help is their ideal working class person. And that has been built into like the entire fabric of Protestant um, um, virtue and charity and this uh, kind of secular liberalism. Every single um, NGO, every single foundation, every single institution on the liberal left has the deep inheritance of this ideology. How you deal with inequality has to do with helping someone who's fundamentally helpless. This is their fantasy. So when I'm like looking at this and I see like people voting for Trump, I'm like, you know what? They're giving them the finger. And in some ways I'm just like, yeah. that's, you know what? You, your fantasy of helping people has been disrupted by um, people who won't accept it. Now, how we yeah. can organize that into some other kind of like progressive collective action other than just this kind of re pure rejection, uh, that I don't know. But, but as long as it's there, I feel like the tinder is ready to light. Um, I, I wanted to, a thought came to me. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, the Guastella and, and, um, uh, and Ahmadi pieces and about how they are not really willing to look beyond the two-party paradigm right or the or the siding with one of the two parties paradigm i guess i guess i should say um but it's fascinating to me that we have kind of the the node here you know the in the union movement right we have an interest group that is still powerful enough that it could do something if it were able mm -hmm. to coordinate itself properly um and we have an example of of how uh, an interest group of a, of a, that level of magnitude can actually exercise incredible political power 
by opportunistically participating in both Democratic and Republican primaries, and that's APAC, right? Like, APAC is, I think, the perfect example of how you hack the American primary system to create um, a kind of... Um, uh, a, a political, um, a politically hegemonic stance without actually dominating both of the two parties, right? You just participate opportunistically. You make sure that every every candidate kind of has to kiss the ring, right? And and you can exercise power drastically, you know, out of proportion to your actual size and 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 direct. But they're not membership. a union. They're not a union. Right, but right. they're an interest group, right? And and they're unions interested. are interest groups as well. If unions were doing this, I think, you know, if unions were actually entering Republican primaries and saying, Hey, we'll endorse you if you yeah. are willing to to be with us on these stances, I think they could mm -hmm. actually they could actually start making headway. And you don't oh, have I to do abandon too. I believe that. I totally right. believe that. And I you totally don't have to abandon that. the Democratic party is at the same time you can do both at once and and it's just so obvious and it's kind of disappointing that neither Ahmadi nor Guastella are are because of their own kind of their the fact of their being enmeshed you know in in the two parties they're not willing to kind of make this this argument in public yeah well if Guastella oh, is not making <laughs> oh sorry Wait, go ahead. Had it. yeah go Okay, I, I just thought this was really interesting because um, one of the things that came up for me, Jamal, and uh, this is something that uh, Guastella addresses, he says, uh, in the short term, um, what electoral interest does the GOP have in closing up to the unions? Very little. And he points out that there's not, the unions can't swing an election at this point. But APEC voters can't swing yeah. an election at this point mm. so and I, I think that both um both guastella and uh so rob uh, agree that it would be it's obviously beneficial if if unions can engage with both parties as opposed to just being having this client relationship with that right. right uh so that that is a very interesting point because immediately my instinct was yeah unions don't have that much power why would republicans necessarily right. On, on block, like on mass, work with them. But um, I think that we should look at the APEC model a little more. Yeah, I, I think I think it. We need money, should... though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I the mean, unions it's... have some money. The unions have money. No, no, that's true. That's right. true. That's true. But isn't this just saying that we need Marxist lobbyists? <laughs> like we're like we're looking for like billionaires like you know the 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 bogeyman george soros is who are actually this but also right. have you know billions of dollars to invest you know i've been know. trying to get him on the phone for no I'm <laughs> george talk to me come on <laughs> well it, it's it's funny because it's funny because i think that um Leftist organizations in, in the United States, but also all over the world, have used a model that has worked, which is um, uh, um, members, member dues driven um, organizations uh, or campaigns like the Bernie Sanders campaign uh, funded by small dollar donations in, you know, in mass numbers um, I think that stuff can build durable institutions if you do it right. Uh, the problem, at least in the U.S., is that every time you've seen this like model, um, it's those funds, those resources have been diverted to the Democratic Party. In the Bernie Sanders case, it's obvious why. There was one guy at the top who was explicitly loyal to the Democratic Party. So, I mean, if you donated to him, uh, you gave him money, and you also gave him your email and phone number. And when his when, he, when his campaign wound down, he gave all of your contact info to the Democratic, the DNC. And so that's why I've been, you know, ever since I donated to him, my phone has been blowing up about this and that Democratic Party progressive, whatever. I, you know, I hate all of them. <laughs> um, but that's if you want to know where that, where you know where your money went, that's where it went. Um, the DSA or other socialist organizations are interesting, too, because in that case, you've got members donating um, to what they believe is an independent effort to uh, advance working class interests. And when I say independent, independent of the two parties. Mm -hmm, but what mm -hmm. happened in that case was uh, maybe the DSA, you know, 
membership body didn't have the right, uh, you know, uh, class demographics, or maybe it was not big enough of a mass organization that whatever the circumstances, the people that got most involved in the DSA and who quickly rose to leadership positions were people that had career interests that ultimately funneled into the Democratic Party. You can't have a political career in the United States that doesn't end end up somewhere in the Democratic or Republican Party. In but, general, you know, you know the other the other path that people took, you know, young people took when they saw a socialist organization was, you know, um, um, an adventure, a politically adventurous path. I mean, this is what Lenin and Marx would call them. I mean. They um, immediately want saw a socialist organization. I saw this happen because I was one of the original founders of the DSA in Orange County, which had been completely, you know, um, moribund before 2016. And there were people who came in immediately. I'm not saying that this was a conscious effort, but they thought, oh, yes, I'm going to unite everyone around the cause of Rojava. And then it became like, I'm going to unite everyone in around the class, around the cause of gender. And... Um, they are, um, you know, part of a kind of vanguardist neurosis of the of the left that immediately destroys um, any possibility for mass organization. You know, I could see that this takeover was going to take was going to stop new um, memberships because it was a membership driven organization. Its power had to do with the fact that after, you know, Bernie, the Bernie campaign, you know, it went from a 30,000 person organization to a 95,000 person organization, but it couldn't break 100. There was no material reason why it couldn't break 100,000. But ideologically speaking, the kind of liberal adventurous, I mean, the, the rad lib adventurism, the um, lack of clear ideological lines, because Harrington wanted it to be like a big tent non- denominational, ecumenical left, you know, what was already seeded, already seeded its, um, its demise, because it wasn't a proper ideologically left organization with a pragmatic um, program. So I think Maria Svart, who I hear was a very good manager, although, you know, I, I and she had to deal with the organization as it was, was stepping down. And she said they have like three, and in her resignation letter, I heard she said they have three months of operating budget. <laughs> because last summer they at the DSA convention, they voted on all these different initiatives and they didn't know how to fund it. Yep, yep. Oh, I think they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on uh, a, a a grievance, harassment, grievance harassment officer, and yeah, grievance yeah. officers. They're, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, the, the DSA what? is a really... Yeah, a, a huge oh, yeah. one of the biggest line items in the DSA budget is paying the exorbitant salary of one harassment grievance officer um, who exists. So they became to, an HR group. They became uh, like yeah. a university. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I and I think this is, you know, if you look at what happened in the DSA, you know, it, it makes me think that actually being explicitly welcoming to Republicans is a precondition of having a, a successful leftist movement because those people are the antibodies that will prevent the rad libs from taking over, right? You need a couple, you know, crotchety Republicans in the room who just aren't going to put or up with more. this stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. because otherwise, it, like you see in every DSA chapter around the country, that initial wave that, that included a, a healthy mix of um, people from different walks of life, working class people, I remember in the immediate aftermath of the Bernie Mounts. There were lots of regular normal people in the DSA. Yep. But because they because they they weren't hardened against what was going to happen to them, they were run out of the room by the the woke tards and That's it right. was just that was the end of it, right? Like right. I, I I don't know. I mean, I I think you need to have you need Republicans in there. Otherwise otherwise the same thing's going to happen. I don't know if that's the solution, but okay. Yes. <laughs> I, I want to say one thing being um, like having been a DSA member since 2017 in DC, which is like where you're going to see the most, like the most, uh, I don't know, 
like obnoxious determined like yeah like uh, political aspirants who want to figure out how to parlay this this for this work they do with dsa into some kind of career with the squad or whatever um i think that like i think it really does very much come down to the the nationals inability to actually or, or lack of interest in actually providing to, to the chapters mm -hmm. um as well as this class composition, because and, and the aspir, the political aspir, the opportunism, all of that too. But I just I, I saw so many uh, like regular and, and very very working class people here in DC um, working for come in um, over the years I've been involved and just leave after like one or two meetings just because you know alienated for many reasons. But there's just constant infighting and. That's why DSA just blew their reserves on a, a harassment and harassment and grievance officer um, because they couldn't control the infighting. They couldn't actually like organize the organization in a way that would deter that kind of bad behavior when people didn't get their way. They would just blow things up and they would blow things up in order to get their way, in order to ascend power in their chapter and national had no way of addressing that. Yeah, the the, the the skullduggery immediately preceding every DSA convention, right, where you have these these uh, word this Google Doc, you know, circulating, uh, alleging you know harassment from this candidate or improper behavior, improper advances from this candidate. None of it with any evidence whatsoever, right? It's like October surprises, you know, immediately before the. <laughs> I didn't know this. I did not. No, know, it's I, great. I, I didn't yeah. know, know this. <laughs> yeah, um, having, so the. Uh, so, yeah. so there has to be like better, like um, a more discipline. So you think it's more Republicans, but I think like there should be um, an articulation of a left managerial um, discipline, a clear articulation of how a leftist organization is not a liberal organization, mm. and that yeah. um, if you want to join it you have to behave in this way and you and it could be very trad it has to be but yeah. in a professional yeah. way like we respect each other but we do not take like ad hominem attacks seriously at all we do not tolerate um um cancellation or vilification of people based on um liberal animus yeah you know, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know the, like i could see ground rules being set out i mean we we from our mistakes. Like I was just completely like bowled over because um, we organized DSA. There were, we, the first meeting was in my home. There were 40 people. Then there were like 170 people at these uh, meetings. And there was all this momentum going forward with, um, um, because we had an anti-fascist uh, confrontation with a group of um, far-right people in Laguna who were staging a kind of um, anti-immigrant um, rally there. And there were people, uh, we saw red flags flying in Orange County. People from LA, from the Inland County, came, Inland Empire came down and sort of shouted down this group of far-right, you know, dummy heads. And, and then the next meeting, you know, happens and all of these people come and we have like some weird like DSA political education guy like droning on. And then the next meeting, there are fewer people and the following meeting, there's fewer people. Like there was no one there to think like, okay, how do we channel this momentum? How do we channel this energy? And a lot of the people were ordinary people, as you would say, or people who were wanting to see their um, politics, like kind of realized. And, um, there has to be a, a thorough vetting of that institution. And, you know, yeah. maybe it's the introduction of um, Republicans, but maybe it has to do with like a kind of radical liberalism where we say we accept people who are anti-abortion. <laughs> like we accept people who want, with the working class interest in mind, if they're committed to redistribution, we accept them you know that we don't take these taboo topics that the democratic party tries to put shove down our throats and say this is okay we want to find like social justice for the polity in this way and then you have to have like a clear um message then but yeah you know 
Yeah, I mean, class unity uh, does not, you know, require its members to take any position on a, any any culture war issue. So we, we have our fair share of members who, you know, you know, they, they yeah, they have a wide range of views on whatever, you know, you know, cultural topics. Weren't there you are. part of DSA for a while? We we were, and and actually, were, right? it, yeah, what and, and we can't. We we left because it was a shit show, but um, it we they didn't kick a, you out. They didn't kick we, you out. No, not as a caucus. No, they they kicked individuals out whenever they found us. But um, we yeah, there there was. I remember one moment during COVID. Um, Hef here uh, published in the Chicago DSA sort of newspaper an article saying DSA should be neutral on lockdown. Like the, the socialist movement should not be endorsing lockdowns and vaccine mandates. Right. And DSA freaked out. DSA absolutely lost their mind. And we're like, this guy's a fascist. You know, we absolute masks forever. Everyone gets the vaccine. No, no, no going to the bar. Right. It was. And, and in retrospect, like, obviously, these people have all abandoned this ridiculous. Well, some of them are still wearing masks, but they've largely abandoned this ridiculous stance. But at the time, it was like any measure of disagreement with their, you know, sl slavish liberal orthodoxy was met with just the, the most vituperative attacks. Right. And the same, you know, the same if you ever say that you can be a pro-life socialist, right? Like, I'm not pro-life, but I can easily acknowledge that someone can be pro-life and substantially socialist. But they just hate it. They won't, they won't go along with it. And, and it's just really hard to, you know... I would, like to, I would like to see that whole debate change to, are you pro-free child care? Yeah. Like, not even talk about that. Just say, are you pro free childcare? Yeah, I, I think you, we have to be able to distinguish uh, between our friends, our allies, and our enemies. And uh, I think um, somebody that comes into a leftist organization which has a, a, a class program and says, uh, you know what, if, if um, f free abortion for everyone isn't part of your program, then I want nothing part to do with it. If if you don't agree with me on on this this whole slew of cultural issues, then you're not the real progressive socialist, you know, uh, uh, fighter for the advancement of of the downtrodden. Um, so that that kind of a person is uh, uh, not just common; it's the norm in these leftist organizations, which tells me that the norm, you know, the 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 median member of these organizations is an enemy, because they want to make um, they want to make class politics ineffectual by by attaching all these you know cultural and ident ident identitarian signifiers to them. Uh, I mean, this comes. I mean, all of these cultural issues are the Democratic Party line, yeah. you know. So if yeah. people come in, um, you know, basically saying you have to agree with the Democratic Party on all of these issues. Guess what? Those are Democrats. They're yeah. the enemy. They're the enemy. And I mean, if I can extend that to, well, I could say I'm Ariane Guastella, but Guastella specifically, anybody mm. like him who says the only way for the advancement of the working class is through the Democratic Party. Guess what? You're talking to a Democrat. That's your political opponent. If, if you want... To, if you want an independent working class or, you know, even socialist movement to, to, to take root in the United States and to actually do something, you have to, regard, you have to regard loyalists of either party as the enemy. So I think there's like a necessary enemy. And, you know, I like Dustin as a person and as a thinker, but I think we can have like open adversarial relationships with each other and still be in an organization. And I think that's what we're thinking about with Amari and Guastella. Like you can have um, tactical alliances with your enemies. That should be like principle number one. Like there is a class enemy. Um, you, we, that is our adversary. You might ally yourself 
temporarily with that class enemy, but on other issues, you ally yourselves with the protagonists of the struggle, which we believe is the majority of Americans, the working class, but we don't um, think it's impossible to talk to you or that you're somehow taboo and we can never be in the same room with you. This is why the Republican thing is very important. It's like your adversary is not taboo. His ideas are not contagious. Like if you talk to him, you are not going to be infected. You actually, we actually have to have healthy adversarialism. This is actually the core of Marxism. Marx admired um, capitalism. And he had the greatest respect for capitalists because he knew how seriously powerful they were. This is the other thing about these like noobs and political organizing. Like they have actually no idea how powerful rich people are. That's, I mean, I know this sounds so stupid and basic, but when you're like grandstanding about some culture issue, it's like, you know what? George Soros, Bill Ackman, Stephen Schwartzman, Elon Musk, they're laughing at you. They're, they're just laughing at this. Like, actually, in the 19th, or late 19th and early 20th centuries, because of leftist agitation action, the capitalists were kind of scared of the working class. But if you're like, if you've got like, um, I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> yeah. If you've got like blue hair, nobody cares. <laughs> Sorry. I, and it's fine to have blue hair, but it's not... The left should not be a subculture where we all agree with each other. Yeah, and yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I've been meaning to I hate to ask... even say that. I mean, having to say that is just like, I feel very dumb having to say that, but. <laughs> I, I think that that's a really, uh, obviously, absolutely true. Um, I, I do have a question, though, <laughs> about, like, where we go from here. And I'm wondering, I'm sure you guys all know that in July, Trump said that, you know, if he gets, you know, when he's president again, he will ban communists, socialists and Marxists from entering the country. And, um, you know, some people <laughs> did have, he say that? Did they actually say that? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And some people have told me, Oh, you know, he's just, uh, he's just crazy. You know, he's just doing his thing. And, you know, like, I really do believe this is part of his personal, um, values as, as opposed to whatever him trying to get attention but whether he would do it or not or try to do it or whatever is anyone's guess i i do wonder though if he tried to do it um and if there was like a a, <laughs> a 21st century kind of like mccarthyist movement would that maybe bring the left together because we're certainly not working together at at this point and we haven't been able to for a long time. I mean that's he's the just not time. effective enough. He's just not effective enough to do that. What would he do? Like say, um right. you have to Google your name Google your name before you come in to see what your public your C V looks like? What well, well the um, the Department the... of Homeland Security is so incompetent over work right now. They would never they would not even be able to do that screening. Well the uh, I think. Maybe the... I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. The, the application for naturalization to become a U.S. citizen still oh, has yeah. the question, have you ever oh, been yeah. a member of the Communist Party? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was never. It... Oh, and, but my favorite question was, have you, are you now or have you ever been the subject of a potentate? I love that one. <laughs> I, I yes. like the one where, where it asks. Yes, I am if... a subject. I am a serf in Tsar, in Tsar Nicholas's court. You know, what what would you say? Like. Yes, right. I believe in King Alfred, king of all the English. I don't believe in the Hanover mon monarchy. I don't. Right. Uh, I love that one. Love I, that I like one. the one about have you committed genocide? <laughs> oh yeah, that one is good too. Have you yeah. participated in any kind of genocidal activity? In which case, we'd have to throw out, you know, Biden and all these other people. Right. But um, but but I think like having a clear idea of what this kind of vanguardism is and this kind of self-destructive aspect to any kind of left organization because i'm seeing it played out now right in the um anti-israel organizing that's happening um and articulating it to each other maybe because we're not all in these organizations we're still a minority of the left itself um ha understanding like when people are participating like they're members of COINTELPRO about to subvert your organization. I think that's good. I think it's a, it's a small sign of hope that we actually can 
um, articulate like what's wrong with these rules of engagement and what a proper left organization's rules of engagement would be. Yeah, and I think um, we really can't give up on this question of how do we build an independent party uh, or, or a workers' party. Uh, I feel like that conversation was in the air um, maybe in the year 2020, 2021, after the failure of the Bernie campaign. Yep. And, uh, <clears throat> you know... It, I remember in the DSA there was a there was a big conversation there was a huge debate about how we do it and to be frank most of the participants of that conversation were democratic loyalists of some shade or other Guastella mm. actually was um, the one advocating for his plan basically advocated for the most independence right uh, from the Democratic Party if, if you know, mm. as surprising as that sounds. Right. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the Guastella Abbott thing, it, it, it is just endlessly fascinating to me because if you read that article and you you don't already know that he's a Democratic loyalist, there's nothing in his plan that indicates that this is a plan purely oriented towards the Democratic Party. The, the party surrogate model is an excellent theoretical intervention on their part. And... It, to me, it's self-evident that this is kind of a, a, a very useful way of thinking about the first steps, right? Like, um, and and it, it's it's happened before. Like the um, the Farmer Labor Party of Minnesota, um, which is currently part of the Democratic Party right. in Minnesota, the DFL, the Democratic right. Farmers. Yep, yep. Right, but during its heyday, it was a party that participated in both Democratic and Republican primaries and ran candidates on both ballot lines, and that's how it became a major third party in the state of Minnesota before, you know, I think it was in the aftermath of the New Deal that it collapsed back into the Democrats. But, you know, it's been done. Uh, the The model has a lot of promise. Uh, really, so we, I, so you, know, guys, you guys have given me an actual... Um, idea for what, like, if we had to be branding ourselves as a third um, political entity could be. It's like a radically open party with class as the priority. So like, come, you know, this is the big 10. Like we don't, we don't, um, we, we don't, no topic is taboo. There can be radical differences on all of these culture war issues exactly and we can put and and you know you take liberals at their word and say this is actual freedom of thought you take libertarians at their word and say you know this is truly like a um a, a, an area of freedom cultural freedom class unity absolute cultural unit absolute cultural freedom traditionalist vanguardist polyamorous i mean you know um, trad cats, like the whole gamut. And, um, I think like saying, like taking on that kind of like radicalization of, um, freedom of speech or freedom of ideas, contest of ideas actually could attract our like unicorn, crazy billionaire donor, uh, maybe, but even without that, I think that that would be like, um, a really strong position to take. We don't care what you think about the culture wars. We really don't care. We don't want to participate in that kind of divisiveness. The only thing we ask is that you don't obfuscate the class issue because that is the priority. Now, what will happen is, of course, the Democratic Party and the drones will come in. I think the enemy will come in from the Democratic Party much more and accuse everyone of being racist, a sexist, you know, transphobic, anti-immigrant, like, all of those things will come probably more from the left. And that in itself will be revealing. But you yeah. say like we have radical freedom of radical freedom of ideas in the cultural sphere. Okay. Uh well we're getting to the end here. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess Okay, I've come up with a solution, Eric. <laughs> I, I, that's my solution. Yeah. You asked for a solution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Great job. I'm just great job. Oh my God. I, I think yeah, I think the focus on class politics is not just uh, important. I think it's like it, it totally uh, it's a non it's a non negotiable. Right. Um, any, you know, uh, you know, working class party has to be class based because uh, well, the, Jew, the, the Jews used to say, is it good for the Jews? 
And right now, like when I see any issue, I go, is it good for the working class? Yeah. And you say and that. You can answer that question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you say the Democrats are going to try, come try to, you know, subvert it. And uh, I agree with that. And I would add that the Democrats that come in and try to subvert it might not um, might not come in with the, you know, the Democratic Party logo on their shirt. Uh, they might not even, you know, um, they might not have career interests tied into the Democratic Party. In the DSA, you don't start out as a Democratic Party operative. You build towards that and you end up that way. So you don't, they can't really, you know, call, you know, see you from the beginning. Uh, but so, but I think that one of the things about left organizations that I've come to really understand, and I don't know if it's possible, is that you have to do massive amounts of intensive counter propaganda. Yeah, like yeah. we don't accept intersectionality because it puts um, gender, class, and race on the same level. Class is different. Class is different. Class is different. Just keep repeating until you're blue in the face. Class is the major is the major function. Class functions to define your position regardless of your gender and race with regards to the mode of production. Like you don't even have to be that complex. You could just say class is a different category than race and gender. Class is a different category than race and gender. It has to be, there has to be, but as you say, people come in without necessarily like advertising their ambitions, but it's because propagandized, they become propagandized. and. All of us have been educated in a deeply ideologically, you know, um, um, noxious system. So there has to be like constant political education. Yeah. But in a in a in a way that acknowledges the fact that the working class knows it's being screwed. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to be like, you know what? I just read the manuscripts of eighteen forty four, and uh, you know, you, we have to be able to listen to each other. And listen to actually the insights of the people who are being most oppressed, actually. So, yeah. I will say that if even if we did have, if there was a party like that, and it was yes. successful in amassing members, um, and there was some kind of capture that was explicitly not in by people who were explicitly not interested in Marxism or or you know socialism. Just having that as a counterbalance to what's currently going on would be really, really good for the left because a, a lot of people come in to like places like DSA and they think that they need to be adversarial toward their comrades. They think that you know it's all about like really? getting having the right line or mm -hmm. you know like like distilling like their like ideal ideology and their you know like their <laughs> their prescriptions for strategy and like if anyone disagrees you know that's the end of that the, the relationship or their participation in that group and um just having an example some modeling of a group that doesn't do that would be uh, incredibly beneficial i think and you mm -hmm. know we would obviously be able to coach members or um, work with members who were interested in our politics and that organization. If that wasn't, if it wasn't our organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't know. I, I think you, you said a bit earlier, Catherine, that um, moments of mass discontent like this are, are hopeful in a sense, because, and I, and I agree that, something's got to give at some point right like the, the the kettle has got to boil over at some point that we can't keep going on like this it's not sustainable for the entire population to hate two out of the two political parties that <laughs> that are that have a chance at power right something's going to shift and i don't know what's going to provoke that shift but i think what what it's likely to be is a, a, an issue that unites regular people in such numbers that you you can't you can't have this kind of vanguardist rad lib you know tip of the spear enter and kind of before anyone has, has a chance to counter mobilize take control of the institutions of, of the organization and kind of impose their own bizarre fantasy world you know discourse structure and, and etiquette norms right um, and and I hope you know I hope it'll happen and and when it does happen I I hope that class unity will be able to kind of 
to to enter whatever that movement is and and kind of help to fortify it from the inside that that's the kind of opportunism that we need you know the the sort of ability to see the opportunity in and intervene like i thought it was going to be health care i thought it was going to be student loan i thought it was going to be the collapse of the mortgage crisis i think it might be actually private equity just taking over everything right now mm -hmm. Um, and we have to be ready to articulate like what the stakes of that are. I don't know if this is happening in your parts of the country, but in every mini mall in California, there is a private equity opened urgent care office. I've seen there, a lot of them. I didn't realize. Okay, that, so yeah, you realize you realize what's happening is that your actual doctor can't accommodate you, and oftentimes they will say, "Go to urgent care." because there's no hospital nearby that has can accommodate you. Your doctor is overbooked and they will take insurance. These are for-profit, private equity, um, sort of like in and out burger um, hus um, doctor's offices that are parasitic to the insurance, the, the fragmentation of the insurance um, industry, to the decimation of public hospitals, to the radical collapse of you know any kind of insurance or Medicare, Medi-Cal that we have. And so this is that like, there has to be a focus, a laser-like focus on the material um, parasitism of private equity. And that, and like, you know, when people like start going off on their little like weird um, subcultural things, there has to be a turning back to that. Like, um, does Blackstone like your position? Blackstone likes DEI. Blackstone is one of the most despicable organizations in the world. Blackstone is under was um, sanctioned by the UN Human Rights Commission. It's like there's no there there has to be a level of um, relentlessness about our education about the um, new functions of capitalism to extract profit now from the most unlikely places. I don't know if you guys know this, but um, the Mars Family Hedge Fund is taking over veterinary practices. I wasn't aware. <laughs> because during the pandemic, people adopted pets. They became very attached to the pets. I we adopted a dog, and um, they realized that this is another area of profit that you can make. And because vets have come out of veterinary schools burdened with massive amounts of student loan debt, the um, traditional idea of a vet care who retires selling her practice to the new vet doesn't happen anymore because the younger vets can't buy the practices. So the Mars family private equity has been buying up all the veterinary practices. VCA is one of the most predatory companies around. So it's fucking everywhere. And like, if you're worried about, you're barking up the wrong tree. So anyway, that I mean, I don't you, you can cut that out, too. But um, <laughs> but I do think that there is a there. So we have to, like, be absolutely crystal clear, like. This is where we can be adversarial with each other, but our focus is on the parasitism of capital on the body of the working class like that's our focus. We can disagree on all of these different issues. We won't vilify you if you don't vilify us. No. So I think to wrap this up, we should um, share final thoughts. We can just go around. Um, if if you have any final thoughts, uh, I've spoken too much already. So let, let's let <laughs> You've you. You've spoken guys just enough. <laughs> uh, Steph, do you want to start? Um, I, I just think this was a great conversation. Um, yeah, and we hope to talk to you more. That. That's it. I know it sounds Pollyannish, but yeah, um, I think that is our work done. I, I don't know. You had some great ideas, but yeah, we should definitely chat more. And I think it was very, very interesting conversation. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I mean, I, I've just been kind of thinking that like one of the things it seems like the left is facing is that its institutional framework is based on the institutionalization of the counterculture. And you get the worst aspects of the counterculture and the worst aspects of uh, the establishment. Yeah, yeah, it's the countercultural establishment now, which is just the worst of all possible worlds. 
it seems like. So I think it is very useful to frame this as uh, in just terms of tolerance, in terms like even in like 17th century terms of like religious toleration. Like, OK, you're a Catholic, you're a Protestant, but that doesn't mean you can just murder each other for, for 100 years or something. Like you have to bury the hatchet at some point and just be people. Um, and I think that can be a very powerful message if we uh, articulate it well enough that uh, you can have you can have your 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 culture war and class politics too. I guess. But yeah, we need the the counter counterculture. We need to deinstitutionalize that shit. <laughs> yeah. Jamal. Um, uh, I'm speaking directly to the Communist Party of China. We will be your <laughs> APAC. Please fund us. <laughs> <laughs> you know what believe me i've tried i've tried <laughs> i've tried i really have tried and you know what they they're so phobic about being seen as interfering with other people's politics well other countries can do it that just <laughs> You're you know what, my, program, my, my best idea would be like, let's just take young leftists to China on tours. <laughs> this is what they did during the Cold War. Birthright. Yeah, they yeah, did that during the Cold... Cultural Revolution too, right? <laughs> did they do that? Yes, and, you know, but that was like only like very hand selected, but the USSR did that all the time. So, anyway, too bad that, you know, we don't have their ear. <laughs> uh I have one final thought. Um, let's, you know, drop the delusion that the Democratic Party is a party of labor or a party of the working class. Um, that may have been true uh, at, to some extent in the faraway past, but there was a, a point in recent American history where the Democratic Party made a very conscious decision to pivot away from the working class. And that was after the year 1986, or oh, sorry, 1968, when Hubert Humphrey, the Democratic, um, the, the progressive upstart, won the Democratic Party and went on to lose to Richard Nixon. And after that, um, I, think it's, I think it's Thomas Frank that talks about this in his book, uh, the McGovern Coalition, uh, yeah, the McGovern um, Commission um, basically put, put the plan together that we're we're going to move away from the la from unions and the working class and we're going to just focus on um you know the middle class professionals and the 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 coalition of minorities i mean it's it was a pretty explicit well documented choice on the part of the democratic party and uh, i mean here you we know, are the, yeah here we are history has written itself yep yeah uh yeah. Catherine, do you have any last thoughts no um my only thought would be you know if there are any concrete things that come out of this please let me know that we can collaborate on i think that it's really important to think about org organization i'm really tired of spontaneous you know um emotional reactions to um the present situation which is pretty dire so um, yeah, thank you for having me and uh, keep me in mind for um, future discussions and also actions and organizational activities as well. Let's just do that. Let's keep it back.